Hi, this is Stu Cook from CCR, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, everyone. John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com, where people who've always wanted to play an instrument are learning bass, despite dealing with things like arthritis, sore muscles, and just getting older so they can play the music that they love and find so much fun and fulfillment in the process. For BassPlayersOnly.com. You want to get it kickstarted? I've got a free PDF download you can get right now. It's called 12 Surefire Tips to Make You a Better Bass Player. You can click the link below if you're watching on YouTube or just go to ForBassPlayersOnly.com forward slash tips. We've got a great interview this week. I've been so excited about this one. Stu Cook from CCR. We did an interview about a little over a year ago. We published it a year, year and a half ago. And I don't normally do a follow-up interview so soon afterwards, unless there happens to be big time far out news. And in this case, there is. If you haven't heard about it yet, there is a new documentary on Netflix. It's about CCR. It's called Traveling Band Credence Clearwater Revival at the Royal Albert Hall. And it's got classic performance of the band and all kinds of really cool scenes of them traveling through Europe and sightseeing and answering all kinds of questions, including Stu, of course. And uh, you, you've got to see it. It's narrated by Jeff Bridges, by the way, and it is great. Hello, Stu. Hi, John. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> I think I a little while. Yeah. Um, so what is with the, the Netflix thing? Was it just sitting in a, a vault somewhere for 50 years and somebody just found it? Or what, what is the story there? Well, it's been, you're partially correct. It's been in the vault for 50 plus years and uh, we knew it was there. Everybody knew it was there. Uh, there was just uh, no agreement upon how it should be used, when or how. You know, we have the concert footage, then we have uh, the background or B-roll footage, the other, you know, the, uh, the non-concert footage and... Uh, the concert was uh, from one night, but then there's a lot of uh, uh, the close-ups are all done the next day. So there's a lot of production that was going to be required to put this together in a story. No one could really figure out what, what the story should be. Uh, should it be about the band? And it's everybody knows, well, anybody that follows Credence knows uh, that we've had a short and uh, dramatic history. <laughs> <laughs> to put it uh, mildly, uh, and that didn't seem to be the way to go. That you know, that's a that's a well known story already. And the, the folks at Craft uh, Records, which is a subsidiary of uh, Concord Music Group, which is a label that Fantasy, our original label, uh, is under, they thought that the 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 story should be just about that night. You know, with the the lead up. The his, some history of the band, the lead up, and and just the, and the performance because that's you know really what the band did. You know we that's what all bands do is we you know get out and perform our material. Uh, once it's recorded, we take it on the road, and uh, no one could ever agree amongst the band, amongst the people. You know we couldn't even agree who owned the rights to this stuff, and we went back and forth and back and forth and. Then it would sit, and then it would get picked up again, you know, and we'd end up at a dead end, a disagreement of some sort over one aspect or another, and back it sat until finally uh, Saul, uh, um, excuse me, uh, Sig Sigworth from Kraft uh, Records decided to uh, take charge and give it some focus, and and he came up with uh, the idea of, of how to present it as a story uh, of the band at its peak rather than a story of the band from beginning to end, you know, which, like I said, is a story everyone knows or thinks they know. What year was it actually recorded? What, 19, what 1969. Wow. And uh, it was the first time uh, we had been uh, out of the country to Europe. 
And so we were like, you know, white eyed kids with cameras and full of expectations and misconceptions about what the rest of the world was like. Uh, but they were able to, they were able to put it together and uh, they got it to a point where they were able to, to uh, take it to Jeff Bridges and see if he would be interested in being involved. And why and, was he chosen? What's the, what's the connection there? You know, I can't, I, I, I wasn't involved. The, you know, the band, none of the band was involved actually in the, the production post-production of the, uh, of the, the documentary, but I can only imagine that it has something to do with the big Lebowski because uh, the Coen brothers used two Creedence songs in that film. And they actually wrote us into the script. Uh, if you recall when, uh, when the dude is in the taxi, well, before he gets in the taxi, his car stolen. Right. I'm trying to think back how this goes. His car stolen. He goes to the police to report the stolen vehicle. And, and he, and he tells him that there was a, a credence tape in the car, you know, eight track or something. And the cop, I think says something to the effect that, we're pretty sure we can get the car back for you, but I, we don't know about the tape. <laughs> okay. and then he's riding in the taxi shortly afterwards. And uh, one of the Eagles come on the radio and he comments that he hates the Eagles. And the cab driver pulls over and throws him out. <laughs> I haven't seen it in so long. I'm kind yeah, of. It's, a, <laughs> it's worth another look. It's, it's, it's truly a cult classic from, you know, that, uh, that that post Caddyshack uh, Blues Brothers kind of era, it, it all has that same sort of uh, cultural context. John Goodman was hilarious in that movie too. Yeah, so they, uh, yeah, he was, <laughs> he really was. You know, it was a stellar. You know, they did all their movies are so well crafted, uh, well written, and and uh, they, uh, it's, it's rare to see uh, siblings work together so well. You know, especially in the artistic. Uh, realm but but they've had a string of successes so to, to me it has to be or it's likely that it's uh, uh the big lebowski because of uh we knew that that jeff was a credence fan i figured there was some connection you guys look like who, i mean who isn't a credence fan come on oh no uh, you guys looked like you had so much fun at the concert and uh naturally there's a lot of great bass playing <laughs> well you know, Doug and I uh, were pretty solid together. Uh, we we referred to it as pick and shovel work. We were just down in the trenches trying to make those other guys look good. Yep. You know, uh, it's uh, when you when you're in a four piece guitar band, there's there's not a you know, I mean, everybody has to have have their assignment and and stick to it, or it quickly comes unraveled. Uh, and you know that was our focus always you know maintain try and try and find the groove quickly and and hang in there uh you know and that that you know the groove moves around a lot uh and you know we're always trying to you know, we were focused on each other doug was always focused on john uh to you know for for cues and uh i'm just listening to the bass drum just a tangent. Did I see you put your left thumb over the top of the neck on the bass? Is that part of your bass technique? Because I I notice things like that. You mean on the on the neck, like like for fretting? Yeah, yeah. I used to do that because uh, that used to be considered almost criminal when I was coming up. And I, I remember watching Jew, uh, Lewis, Lewis Johnson had a video on slapping and he said, now what you do, you take your thumb and you put it over here. And he was talking like this. Is I've seen that video. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, I picked it up uh, playing guitar, you know, uh, for. Uh, That's not any the, better. <laughs> but instead of, instead of making the full bar chord, you could get the root note. Uh, you know, when you're in the first position, you can get the root note and then then you skip string five, then you can play four through one, yeah. uh, uh, you know, getting, you know, the, 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 the chord shape or the, the, you know, yep. the, the interval. That, that should be okay. You know, I just, I don't, don't do it on a five string, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah you too. Uh, unless I just drop everything and go for that one note, but yeah. uh, 
but you know the electric base is uh, very easy to develop bad habits on. I guess people just you know it's it's your own style, your own way to play. Unless you're professionally trained, you know you can get into a lot of weird habits. Just you know, for instance, electric bass players quite often, I think probably mostly, use one finger per fret. But you'd kill yourself if you did that on an upright. Yeah. Well, down at the bottom, it's one, two, four, and then you get up. And yeah, you get you're you're almost crab clawing uh, for the for the strength. Is right. it, you know, it takes a lot of work to play a string bass. And you get up to about the twelfth fret or so, and then you go into thumb position. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a, it's really a different instrument. It's it's more like a guitar. So you know we. It is a guitar. It's a bass yeah. guitar. Yeah, exactly. It has frets and, and your notes are precisely in tune, right? <laughs> right. If the bass is out of tune, the whole band's out of tune. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> hey, there were a couple other things I noticed that really took me back. Those custom amps with the padding all the way around and the uh, the coil cords, the, you know, like, like the kind they used to have on telephones. So. <laughs> I remember we used to have a custom, I think it was a PA or a custom oh, amp. Or something. I'm going way back. Somewhere here in my studio, I have still got my blue coil cord. Coil cord. Yeah. With the old Switchcraft uh, jacks on them. Plugs, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned Doug and you mentioned John. I wanted to ask you that, that Tom Fogarty doesn't seem to get talked about a whole lot. And I just wanted to ask you well, how you'd like him to be thought of. How would you like him to be remembered? Well, Tom was a, Tom was a great guy. He was a super solid rhythm guitar player, uh, took it very seriously. And, uh, you know, his, his playing really added to the group sound. You could, if you, know, if you compare the, the work of the quartet to the work of the, the one album that the, the, that followed his departure, uh, we did as a trio. You can see that he was uh, sorely missed. Um, he was the impetus that, that that got Doug and I and John into the studio. He was older than John, right? He was four. He was four years John senior, and he uh, was was interested in making records from from day one. He was in another band with guys that could really play back in the day. This is in the, in the, uh, uh, early sixties. Uh, they, you know, they were one of the biggest bands in the Bay area, spider web and the insects. And, uh, I guess, <laughs> I guess spider might've been the drummer, but Tom was the lead singer. And, uh, he was always trying to get those guys to learn songs and go into the studio. And he always complained that they would rather hang out with girls, chicks, and uh, work on their cars. So finally, he came to us and asked us if, if we would you know, learn his songs and he would take us into the studio. So he was really uh, the, uh, the guy who got us into the recording studio the first time. And uh, well, almost all of our recording was done with him. Uh, we, I don't think we ever really, I don't recall recording as an instrumental trio ever. We always, uh, it was Tommy Fogarty and the Blue Velvets. So, uh, yeah, he doesn't get a lot of mention. You know, he went on, he had a, a solo career after he left the band. He left the band in 1972 after uh, not being able to come to any kind of uh, artistic understanding with, with Brother John. You know, Tom wanted to, wanted to contribute. He, you know, he had been the band leader and uh, stepped aside uh, to let John uh, lead the band in 1968, 67, actually. And uh, he wanted the opportunity to contribute again, and, and John wouldn't have it. And uh, he must have quit a half a dozen times. Doug and I talked him back into it, into staying. You know, was, we didn't, we, we, we saw this as a, as a major problem going forward if, if Tom left the band. Uh, I mean, for the whole band, you know, we not just us, our, ourselves personally. And, you know, it, it was always the four of us. And uh, his, uh, we, he finally, we, you know, we knew we just couldn't hold him anymore. He, he, he had to follow his muse. And so he left uh, and formed a band called Ruby 
which was a pretty good rock and roll band. Uh, had a really tight rhythm section and a, uh, and a, another fellow who played lead guitar, Tom played rhythm and sang, wrote and sang. And uh, they played around the San Francisco Bay Area quite a bit. They did, I think, maybe three albums, three or four albums. Uh, he signed with Fantasy Records, of course, which didn't endear him to, to John, who was at war at the time with Fantasy. So, uh, yeah, you're right. He, you know, he, mention of, of Tom has has, has been, uh, you know, uh, you know, obviously not as frequent as as John or or D or Doug or myself, but uh, but yeah, I mean. When you have a rock and roll band like like ours, everybody is important. I mean, it's all all the pieces fit together, and that's that's why it, it works. Uh, it could have been uh, John and three other guys, and it wouldn't have been the same. We'll never know, of course. But you know, I mean, the the four of us did the work, and uh, when you know when you pull twenty five percent out, it it definitely had an impact. So uh, it was. Uh, you know, it was a shame to see him go, but we all understood. Doug and I understood. I'm sure John knew as well that that uh, you know staying under the under the circumstances wasn't going to work out. So, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's too bad that he's. Well, you know, that's it's not an uncommon story in in uh, rock and roll. Well, I wanted to ask you, I, mean, uh, I, I promise not to beat this to death, but yeah, I've, I've interviewed Steve Boone from the Love and Spoonful, and, you know, the whole John Sebastian thing. I've interviewed uh, Michael Anthony from Van Halen. And, you know, so, and, and you and I have touched on this a, in, a little bit in the previous interviews. This is actually our first video interview. So I, I'm sure our audience would like to hear from you you know, last time you talked about things, you mentioned words like burying the hatchet, and you said time has a way of softening things. And, uh, uh, you know, you say <laughs> you're all in your 70s. And, you know, what, what can you share with us about what's going on with the relationship and maybe even reuniting? Yeah. Well, those are a bunch of nice platitudes I gave you. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, you're right. We're both right. Uh, time, you know, does take the edge off of off of uh, unpleasant uh, memories. Uh, you know, you have, it's in our case, we have so many good memories to focus on. You know, it's it's ridiculous to uh, to to only look at the you know the the negative stuff. You know, yeah, it was a shame the way the band ended up. A lot of things went wrong along the way. Uh, but, but, you know, that's sort of the case in, in that sort of the way life works, uh, you know, good days, bad days. But, um, I think that largely we've gotten past that, you know, it's a shame Tom's no longer with us, but, uh, but Doug and I, and, 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 uh, Trisha, Tom's widow have been working together with John to try and, uh, you know, have a, uh, a productive business relationship, if that makes sense. Uh, we're never going to, uh, you know, take the stage together again. I think too much has been said, and you know, you know, at the time, the time came and went for that. For that, you know, when that would have been better when we were all better play, you know, more in our youth, stronger. More aggressive uh, uh, approach would have been uh, would have been helpful, but uh, I think now we're like you say we're all in our late seventies. Well, I was just repeating back to you what you said to me. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, you know I'm pushing seventy eight now, and uh, while I can still play, I, I don't know that, that that the satisfaction of you know it would be more satisfying, I think, for for the fans than it would be for us. To get together, I mean, that's not a bad reason. No, no. Uh, I mean, that's why we're even having this conversation. Actually, if it wasn't for the fans and, and radio, there would have been no credence. Uh, I think that for me, I mean, I'm I'm totally open to something like that. But I, I think that a that a an adult conversation would have to precede it, you know, to just lay the groundwork for 
you know, rather than just, you know, everybody strap on guitars and, 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 and just start making noise just to, uh, to say we did it. I think that we'd have to, we'd have to truly have respect for each other, who we are now, you know, and that, that would tell me that, that the, the past had really been laid to rest. You know, I would, it wouldn't have to be a long conversation, but would the, you ever want to initiate that adult conversation with John? Yeah, you know, I've tried in the past. Uh, How long has it been? Oh, gee, I, live, I was living in LA, so that would have been uh, back in the 90s, maybe, <laughs> 30 some years ago. Uh, I mean, it's a conversation worth having if, 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 if there's anyone else to have it, but uh, you know, in, until there's there's any interest, I I don't feel uh, necessarily uh, uh, obligated, or you know, that I sh I don't feel I should take the lead in uh, trying to make some kind of rapprochement. Uh, Doug and I get along fine, uh, so. Uh, you know, it's just better to let things like our our wood our our work at Woodstock and this documentary at, of Albert Hall. I think they speak better for the band at its, especially uh, when the band was at its peak. You know, that's the way that I like to see the band remembered. It's a great band, and fortunately, we've got those records, and now we've got this great documentary on Netflix. Let's switch gears totally. <laughs> <laughs> For bass players only as, a, uh, as an instruction site. And as I said at the beginning, most of the people are, are over 50 men in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and they're not trying to make careers out of being professional bass players. They want to play some classic rock riffs with their friends and some jazz maybe and some other stuff. And as I also mentioned, you know, when you get older, things like arthritis and tendonitis and recovering from surgery and all those things, well, that is a lot of the, the, the students at ForBassPlayersOnly.com. But they want to have fun and they want to play bass. So I want to take this opportunity to ask you what advice you have for somebody like that that wants to learn to play the bass. What do you think they should be thinking about? Hmm. As a as amateur advice giver, <laughs> uh, you know, starting from scratch, you know, I think that that it's probably the best time to actually learn how to how to be a musician. In other words, I think you know, there's there's three ways that that that, that the music comes into you through your ear, through your eyes. It's actually only two ways, isn't there? You, can, but I think that if you're going to use your eyes, that it takes just. You're going to say your heart or your soul. Or yeah, anything. I was going. I was going to get all crazy on you there. Uh, then I realized there's only two, uh, and they work together. But if you're going to use your eyes, I think I think that it takes as since I've been around the block with this, I think it, it's actually more efficient to learn how to read music. You know, and under and learn some basic music theory to, for whatever instrument you want to uh, to try and learn, uh, rather than things like tablature. That combined with your ear, uh, you know, if you can read, you can you can always work. I mean, you don't have to to, to do it full time, but if you can read music, you can you can play gigs with uh, all kinds of gigs with all kinds of players in in any genre. Uh, it doesn't just have to be, uh, you know, pounding out Aerosmith covers on Saturday night, uh, which you can learn with your with your ear. I mean, or with tab. I don't think there's many transcriptions of Tom Hamilton's bass parts, but uh, but you know there, there there's quite a few ways that that you can pick them up. But uh, if, if you're serious about music in general, then that's the way to go. You know, take the time. To, to learn how to read uh, uh, sheet music or whatever, you know, whatever is tab, not tablature, uh, legit music. Uh, for the pe people that are already playing, I would say warm up is a, the single most important thing you can do. If, for a singer, for a pe players that use their hands, drummers, 
we all have to warm up and get the muscles warm or we're going to be, especially the older we get, we're going to be more and more prone to injuries, which will interfere with our progress and our enjoyment. Anything you can do to prevent uh, tendonitis, you know, uh, from, you know, keeping your hand in one position all the time. It's just, it's, as we get older, we get less and less flexible. We need to stretch more, much more than, than, uh, than kids, younger people do. And, uh, you know, that, that not getting injured and, and knowing as much about music as, as you could possibly absorb, I think, are the, the two keys to really enjoying any instrument, but, but bass for sure. Uh, you know, bass players, good bass players, reading bass players are in demand. You know, uh, anybody can strum on, uh, I, well, not anybody, but most people can strum on a guitar, you know, play along, uh, entertain themselves and friends. But if you want to uh, get the most out of out of the, the bass with, with pretty near the least amount of investment is you know train your train your mind and train your train your ears yeah good advice what i also tell people is you don't have to be victor wooten you don't have to be an acrobat you know you can you can make the music feel great with the simplest bass line that doesn't put a lot of undue wear and tear on the old muscles and bones absolutely i mean very few of us are going to be able to play like these guys who shred you know the you know, I mean, I guess the first shredder that I was aware of was uh, was Billy Sheehan, uh, you know, the first guy to step it up on the front of the stage. And now there's hundreds of guys that are just absolutely amazing. That's not what people want in a bass player, though. You know, you can go if you want that, you just go to the NAMM show and go to any booth and there'll be guys that are so Happy. amazing, Happy. just thumping away as like popping and thumping and popping. And, and I tried it and I tried it and I tried it. And, you know, it just wasn't me. So uh, I stopped trying it and, you know, I do what I do. And, uh, you know, I, I wish that I had continued with my formal music education, but uh, I can't complain. Uh, you know, what, what, I, what I, the work I did put in got me a lot further than, than anyone would have expected. <laughs> What about the future? What else do you have coming up or are you busy these days? I tell, I tell people that what I used to do as a profession, I now do as a hobby. Okay. So basically what I've been doing musically. That's great. That sounds like the perfect thing to do. Yeah. In the meantime, I've been hanging out with a bunch of characters. We just play acoustic guitars. We don't have a, a drummer. So I, I generally don't bring my bass. You know, we all plug in, we all got mics, and everybody's got a, a list of songs that we know and, you know, the words to, and <laughs> we know the chord changes. And you we like just... Classic rock tunes? or, or Yeah, what? you know, a lot of Beatles stuff, Petty, uh, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, you name it. We'll, we'll play any the Eagles, any, you know, any song anybody wants to do. Hey, let's, let's do this one. What key do you sing it in? Let me transpose it quickly and, you know, we'll, let's play it. And... These three guys sing really well together. It's a joy to listen to them sing. They sound, uh, you know, really tight. Uh, you know, like the Bee Gees or the Eagles, they have that kind of really smooth blend. And so uh, we go to this guy's garage once once a month and uh, and hang out. And I sang at a couple of birthday parties. And, you know, I do bar mitzvahs and weddings, and <laughs> I bought a a really nice uh, Mike Lel Telly. Uh, so I've been playing, I've been uh, teaching myself how to play lead guitar and, and more more sophisticated uh, uh, rhythm guitar voicings and things like that, uh, chord shapes. And, uh, you know, the progressions are all pretty standard. Uh, but you know, I'm trying to stay interested in it. I'm trying to get back into a home recording studio environment. My son is, is pretty... Uh, savvy to uh technology so i'm relying on him quite a bit to uh help me line up uh you know the minimal amount of equipment i need yeah. that i can just come and plug in and you know get to work with ideas because i walk around the house with guitar on i go oh that's cool by the time i got upstairs i've forgotten it <laughs>
Anything else going on or coming up? Not for me. You know, I'm 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 still traveling. I'm still able to see the world. So my wife and I are uh, going to places we haven't been and back to places we have been. But I'm still uh, an active scuba diver. Oh, yeah. uh, so you know, health permitting, I'll keep doing that uh, as long as I can. I just don't go as deep as I used to. Uh, try to play golf still, but uh, not much luck there. <laughs> It's a four-letter word. It sounds like you're doing well, having a good time and enjoying yourself. Well, you know, I I told my wife, I said, this retirement is, you know, it's great to have, not to have to be anywhere. It's great not to have to be at the airport or be at Soundcheck or be, you know, or another crappy hotel lunch uh, or another bad catering uh, dinner. Uh, All those things are great. I miss, I miss the 90 minutes, 120 minutes on the stage. And, and I, right now, I just don't seem to have found anything that is uh, a passion. And she says, that's all right. Most people don't have one either. Yeah. Well, sometimes <laughs> they find you when you're not looking for them. Well, you know, I'm open. I'm, I've, I've always let the universe guide me. And, uh, I mean, that's been part of Credence's success, I think, is that uh, there was really – we didn't have uh, – Clive Davis, and we didn't have uh, Irving Azov. We didn't have, uh, you know, a bunch of, we didn't have an A-team, you know, behind the scenes A-team to to make things happen. And we had to rely on the universe and radio. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, their, and the listening audience uh, to, to make the career happen. Unfortunately, we didn't have anybody that would act as a referee you know, when, when things got rough, so uh, the career was short-lived. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally into, into cosmic happenings. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for the great music. I mean, that You're will welcome. never change. Yeah. Well, it's so great catching up with you, and it's especially nice to do it, uh, what did I say, a year, year and a half after we just did it. So let's keep in touch. Please and, do. Uh, it's always great speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm John Liepman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com, where people who've always wanted to play an instrument are learning bass, despite things like arthritis and sore muscles and everything else that comes with getting older. And they're having fun and finding so much joy and fulfillment in the process. Thanks so much to our very, very special guest this week, Stu Cook. I will see you all next week. Once again, I'm John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Don't forget that free download for BassPlayersOnly.com forward slash tips, 12 surefire tips to make you a better bass player. In the meantime, I will see you all next week. Let's play bass.